Thank you, everybody, for joining the Women's Center Shelter today for our Domestic Violence Awareness Month program. Specifically, today we have DV and youth. Um, and we have a very exciting hour uh, full of good information. So again, thank you for joining. I just want to give a little bit of heads up that this presentation may deal with some specific cases of domestic violence, which may be difficult or triggering to attendees. So please do whatever it is you need to do to take care of yourself. And we also ask that our participants keep themselves muted during the presentation. And to get started, we have three fantastic presenters today. First up, we have Kayla Causer, who is our children's counselor. Kayla has been with the Women's Center and Shelter for six years, working first in our children's advocacy program before becoming our full-time children's counselor, a role in which she works directly with children who have been affected by domestic violence. Next up, we have TK Kennedy, our children's advocacy program supervisor. TK was an advocate and a program supervisor in our emergency shelter for five years before becoming our children's advocacy program supervisor in 2021. She leads the growing team of children's advocates to support families staying in our shelter. And we also have Rhonda Fleming, our Chief of Prevention, Intervention, and Outreach. As the Chief of Prevention, Intervention, and Outreach, Rhonda oversees many virtual of Women's Center Shelter's direct service programs, such as, get ready, uh, our Education Schools Program, Refugees, Immigrants, and Limited English Speaking Team, Outreach, LGBTQIA plus Outreach, Homeless Providers, IPV, CYF, so Children, Youth, and Families, IPV, Men's Batter Intervention Group, Medical Advocacy, Shelter, Hotline, Children's Advocacy Program, so much more. Uh, but Rhonda's journey at Women's Center Shelter began 32 years ago, educating school-aged children and teens about healthy relationships and dating violence. We do have time scheduled at the end for a question and answer at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout. Our fearless leader and President CEO, Nicole Molinero, will handle the Q&A sessions, uh, Q&As for this session. We'll take the most commonly asked questions and post them to our panel. Please know that you can also message Kristen or Emily privately to ask your questions if you don't want to ask publicly. So you can ask your questions by putting them in the chat or by coming off mute to ask your question, raising your hand and coming off mute to ask your questions. But before we move on with our presentation, I would like to thank our sponsors for this session of the DV and Lunch and Learn series, Aspirant, and welcome Mike McLean to say a few words about their amazing partnership with Women's Center Shelter. Please take it away, Mike. Thank you, Maggie. I really appreciate it. And great to see so many people on the call today. Um, I, as Maggie said, I am the CEO at Aspirant. We're a management consulting, technology consulting, and recruiting process outsourcing company. We're headquartered here right on the North Shore of Pittsburgh. And we are proud of our long relationship with Women's Center and Shelter. And it is all funneled through what we call our Connection of Hope program to help uh, create awareness for and help prevent domestic violence. So this is a very important cause to us. One of the things that I would really want to point out to everyone on the call, um, Aspirant is very focused. One of our focus areas is app development. And we've worked with WCNS over the years to develop our Are You Safe app and grow that app. So when we're talking about youth and teens and college age um, people, that app is a lifeline. So it's are you safe? And please take a look, see if you can encourage people to download that app. It could really help. As far as um, this topic and why we chose to sponsor DV and youth, I don't know if people really are aware of the impact uh, on youth. So one third of teens experience physical, sexual, or emotional violence in relationships. 43% um, of college women report violent or abusive dating behaviors. It is a problem among youth as well as adults. But what's even more impactful is education at an early age. Think about organizations like WCNS and all the value they provide to victims and survivors of domestic violence. Wouldn't it be wonderful if those types of organizations were needed less or not even needed at all because we eradicated the problem. The only way to do that is through education of our youth and educating at an early age enables 
um, youth to change behaviors, to understand relationships and have more healthy relationships, which can help prevent domestic violence in the future. And it's the only way we can break the cycle. So thank you again. We're proud to be sponsoring this event and I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll start the presentation by talking about some facts and statistics about DV and youth, um, move on to effects um, DV has on youth and then counseling and intervention. Um, so about 5 million children witness domestic violence each year in the United States and 40 million adult Americans grew up living with domestic violence. Children from homes with domestic violence are much more likely to experience significant psychological problems, both short term and long term. And those children who have experienced domestic violence often meet the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, known as PTSD. Um, and the effects on their brain are similar to those seen experienced by combat veterans, so really serious effects. Those who grew up in um, homes with domestic violence are six times more likely to commit suicide and 50% more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. And children of domestic violence are three times more likely to repeat the cycle in adulthood um, as growing up with domestic violence is the most significant predictor of whether someone will engage in domestic violence later in life. So as we see, there are some really scary um, and a bunch of different outcomes that can come from experiencing domestic violence in youth. So there can be um, a range of different effects that domestic violence has on youth. Um, children are often much more aware of what's going on around them and in their home, especially when DV is present. And we may realize even if they are not physically present for when the incidents are occurring, they may still pick up on dynamics between caregivers, dynamics between themselves and their caregivers, um, how their caregiver responds to different things in the home and their caregiver's ability to um, interact with them, things like that. Um, I often think of the example of if you've ever seen someone or maybe you've been the person who was maybe a little nervous holding an infant and the infant's kind of fussy, you can, they can tell that you're nervous and that goes on through, you know, childhood as well. Um, children can experience and conceptualize what they've witnessed in unique ways and they have their own unique needs based on what they've experienced and um, their responses to what they've witnessed and their needs based on their responses can present in many different ways. As we know, no two children are different and there is no blueprint for how kids will exhibit symptoms and react to the things that they've experienced. Um, so some different um, behavioral changes that can present themselves in youth who are experiencing DV include, but are certainly not limited to acting out. And this could look different depending on the age of the child hypervigilance, which is um, where they're constantly assessing for danger in children. This often looks like being overprotective of their parents and hyper aware of the situations that their parents are in. Progression, and an example of this would be um, a child wedding themselves when they're previously potty trained. Trouble maintaining friendships, becoming withdrawn or avoidant, changes in school performance, which can be both positive and negative. We often think first of the negative outcomes, um, children who are experiencing domestic violence may, you know, not have a lot of control or feel a lot of sense of control in their home life. And school is something they can really control and have a hand in. So we often see kids who become even more focused on school. Um, increased irritability, changes in attachment, delayed self-regulation, and issues understanding appropriate boundaries. So early intervention is the key to helping mitigate negative effects of domestic violence. Just one positive and secure relationship with an adult significantly increases a child's likelihood of success. It decreases the incidence of suicide and other negative outcomes. And this relationship doesn't have to be you know, with a parent or caregiver. It's any you know, trusting and supportive adult in the child's life that helps them to feel safe and secure. And that could be therapist, coach, youth group leader, things like that any adult in their life. And being a supportive, reliable adult can look like believing the child when they talk about their experience, not you know, questioning, did that really happen or anything like that? We believe what they say and we listen to what they have to say. Approaching the child with the mindset of what happened to you rather than what did you do? We so often hear you know, about a bad kid and not thinking about what may be happening in that child's life to create those behaviors and create those responses within the child. Um, being a supportive adult can look like modeling appropriate responses to both positive and negative emotions. Often kiddos who are experiencing domestic violence 
um, don't have great examples of what handling big emotions looks like. So being that person can be so helpful to a child. Um, meeting the needs of the child as they state them rather than assuming you know that their experience or their needs better than them. We don't know their experience and we don't know what they're needing. So asking them and supporting them in that way. So one of the best ways to help break the cycle of violence, as well as helping children process and appropriately cope with what they've experienced is therapy. And mental health therapy has shown to help children process the trauma they've experienced, understand and manage the broad scope of feelings they may be experiencing, and equip them with coping skills to manage the big feelings that they're having and the events that may happen in the future. So every child presents to therapy with their own unique needs, their own thoughts, their own beliefs about therapy. And it's the goal of the therapist to create a safe space for the child, both physically and emotionally, um, where they can process and learn from, you know, the time they spend in therapy. And this could look like, you know, giving the child a lot of autonomy. So having the room be how they want it to be, whether that be a locked door, an unlocked door, open blinds, closed blinds, whatever helps them to feel most physically secure and safe. Um, they're free to share as much or as little as they want to during session. You know, they're empowered to have total autonomy over their story and what's going on in their lives and who they share that with. Um, all emotions are welcome in therapy and they're not judged for having any emotion and how those emotions are coming out or how they're expressing themselves, no matter how big, small, how good or bad we deem them. All emotions are welcome and all emotions are totally valid. And allowing the child to lead sessions is really important as well. Sometimes that looks like processing trauma. And sometimes that looks like talking about kitty cats for 30 minutes, because that's what the child needs at that moment. And that's what they feel most comfortable with. So children who have experienced DV have often um, not been given a lot of autonomy. So we want to make sure we give them that autonomy and counseling. And at Women's Center, we have counseling available for children ages five to 18. And those sessions can be done via Zoom or in person, whatever the family is most comfortable with. And the goal of these sessions is to be child-centered, be trauma-informed, and to utilize the different methods that I've talked about, allowing the children to have a lot of autonomy, be empowered, learn a lot of coping skills. Um, and in those coping skills, figuring out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, if you know we introduce a coping skill and they're like, oh, Kayla, that does not work for me. They don't have to use that. That's not for them and that's totally okay. And we wanna make sure we give them all of the space and time they need to figure out who they are and what they need. Now to TK. Hey, so I'm TK and I'll be talking a little bit about um, the CAP program, which stands for the Children's Advocacy Program. Um, it is a newer name. We used to just be called the Children's Program, but we really wanted to reflect the advocacy work that we do. Um, so the goal of the CAP program is to provide a welcoming, nurturing space um, where child witnesses of intimate partner violence can heal from trauma. And that could look a lot of different ways depending on the day and time of day. Um, we provide childcare, direct service, advocacy um, to any mother who is utilizing Women's Center and Shelter Services regardless of age um, and regardless of what other department that they're also working with. Um, one of the things I think that you know, people are a little confused is we're not um, a daycare, but we're kind of a respite. Um, so we are a place where moms can drop off their kids um, if they need to rest, if they need to shower, if they need to kind of regroup and get some space. Um, you know, to themselves, if they need to attend um, psychoeducational groups that we offer in shelter, if they have any criminal justice, um, you know, court cases that they have to attend or any medical appointments, um, we want to give them that time and space to be able to do that. Um, and we are not open 24 hours. We have specific hours um, throughout the day and throughout the week um, that we are open and we try to have that schedule and calendar available for all of our families. So this is just um, a little brief overview of what the space looks like. Um, we are in the process of revamping the spaces. So um, the spaces that are pictured right here are um, the main play space area and the piazza, which is also called the creation station. 
Um, and on the other side, we have a nursery. So um, anything that moms might need for their babies um, in the nursery, such as diapers, wipes, um, formula, any other basic item that we have down there, you know, we try to give that to them so that they're not trying to put their pennies together to get stuff um, for their child. Or if, you know, they're trying to get their, you know, food stamps or cash assistance, you know, switched over, we want to be able to eliminate that challenge that they, that they might have getting those resources. Um, and in the play space area, we do have a lot of um, interactive activities. Um, pictured here is the dress up um, armoire that we have um, that the kids love to dress up and play superheroes. And um, they like to, you know, play the store, which is right next to it. They like to feed us fake, um, fake meals in their restaurants, which is really fun. We have a little kitchen that you see, and then a little washer and dryer, which has been a new addition, which the um, younger kids really enjoy learning the process of washing their clothes. Um, and then with the Piazza, it has newly um, been named the Creation Station, which is kind of a space for children to um, be able to express themselves creatively um, and promote healing through art. We have a great partnership with Art Expressions, which comes in on a weekly basis and does really fun artistic activities with the kids. Um, pictured here is the what we call the Calm Down Castle, which eventually will probably turn into a Zen zone. And it's a space um, that gives children ownership of, you know, processing their, their feelings. It's a space for them to calm down. Um, it allows children and our CAP team to take a break together, regulate their emotions. Um, we have uh, noise canceling headphones. We have a lot of sensory items in this area. Um, so, you know, poppets are really big right now. Our kids love those. We have some coloring books. Um, we also have some yoga mats and we have a couple of new weighted blankets in this area as well. Um, picture here, we have the team space um, and the technology lab. Um, the team space is a space that we have um, been re revamping over the past couple of months. And we actually got this beautiful donation of a piano that was also painted for the specific space. The kids love to play on the piano. Um, we have some programming that comes in and works with the children um, and teaches them, you know, music. We have DJ workshop, which they're able to kind of write their beats and record it on the little microphone that you see there. We also have a huge gaming system, which a lot of the teens love. Um, a lot of us are very competitive in CAP. So we'll, um, you know, we'll try to beat each other in Mario Kart um, or try to play each other in foosball, just to kind of allow the children to be a child in that space and to, you know, really feel like, you know, they're not necessarily in a shelter, but in a space where they're able to act their age and make friends. Um, and then with the technology lab, we do have a lot of, um, as you can see, computers. We have iPads that have been donated. And this is really our educational hub. So we have an after school program um, that comes in and they help with after school tutoring. We also help with homework. Um, these computers can also be used for some of the um, really popular computer games like Minecraft and Roadblocks, which is a, a huge hit. But this is an area that if a child needs to catch up on schoolwork, if they don't have access to a computer or if they're doing um, schooling online, this is the area that they would complete that in. Um, our outdoor space is one of our other areas that the kids really love, um, especially on a really nice day. So we have um, just revamped our garden, which was really cool. Um, Eaton Park and Grove Pittsburgh teamed up and they actually um, planted a bunch of um, fresh produce, which we have been picking and using in our program. We also use it in shelter to prepare the meals for the community, which has been really cool. And the kids love to water that. They love to see the process of growing fruits and vegetables. Um, and then we also um, created this kindness rock garden over the summer um, through our summer programming. And it um, allows volunteers, staff members, residents, um, whether they're staying in our shelter or they're utilizing our services to engage with one another by painting a rock, adding a rock or taking a rock design with in inspirational words and quotes. So it's kind of whatever you need for that day or for that week. And if you take one, the idea is to leave one for someone else. So kind of paying it forward. Um, so this is kind of just an overview of what our CAP team looks like. So with the CAP team, we do have full-time um, direct service advocates. We also have a children's behavioral support advocate on the team. And then we really rely on substitute advocates and volunteers to help um, with our programming. 
Um, and it kind of depends on, you know, the time of year, how many we have, but it's, it's a, a team effort and making sure we're safely able to have all of the programming that we want to and that we need to have. Everything that we do um, right now is under a case management model. So once a family enters shelter, they are put on a team and they specifically have a child advocate that works with them, that provides them case management, um, that helps them with, um, you know, individual advocacy, group advocacy, um, you know, those sorts of things. And it's, it's also a team effort with the shelter advocates as well. Um, and then just some of the core responsibilities of a, of a CAP advocate besides um, childcare, they also design the structured programs, they design the curriculum that we utilize for our groups. Um, they help with completing referrals and resources for moms. Um, they also help with the intake interview process, making sure that they have everything that they need, making sure if they need assistance with filling out applications or getting things switched over, we're able to help them you know, with that as well. Um, and then just school enrollment is a huge thing that we do um, through the CAP program. So we wanna make sure that they have stability in that area. We help um, with getting them enrolled. We help getting them emergency transportation through the McKinney-Vento Act, which I'll um, be talking about in a little bit. Um, go a little bit into detail about what that kind of encompasses um, and making sure they're just set up to succeed in education. So one way that we support um, families with education and employment is through the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. So once a family gets into shelter, um, one of the things we do is we ask, um, you know, the mom, which children are school age and which child, um, you know, whether they're attending school or they would like to attend school, kind of where they are in that process. Um, so under the McKinney-Vento Act, it's really designed to address the challenges that homeless children face um, with enrolling, attending, succeeding in school. Um, so we want to make sure that if a child is in school and it's safe for them to return to that school, that they're able to get everything set up for that. If they're in school, but it's not safe for them for some reason, whether it's, you know, safety concerns because of the domestic violence, whether it's a transportation challenge, um, or whether mom just wants them to be a little bit closer to our shelter, we'll help them with that process. And we actually sit down with the mom and we fill out that paperwork and we work with our school liaisons to get them all set up. So under the McKinney-Vento Act, um, it really requires homeless students um, the right to remain in their schools of origin, which schools of origin is the school that they're at prior to entering shelter. So we really try to keep them there if, they, if that is a safe option, but it's really in the best interest of the family and the child. Um, it's really um, survivor centered. So the family, we allow the family to tell them exact, to, to tell us exactly, you know, what they need from us and what, um, you know, any barriers or challenges that they might have. And they have access to all the programs and services um, through the school, whether that's before school time, after school time, all of that is covered under the McKinney-Vento Act. So we know this process can be very overwhelming. So as soon as the family, you know, enters shelter, they complete their intake, and then we start that process for school and enrollment. We directly work with the liaisons. We want to eliminate that barrier for them. Um, and we do have a couple of contacts through Allegheny County um, and a, a schools that are a little bit outside of Allegheny County that we work with um, that are able to help us kind of navigate the system. We have um, what we call feed, feeder schools. So if the school of origin is not a safe option for a child or their family, we um, at Women's Center, we have a couple of schools that we're able to, you know, call and connect with and they're able to enroll the child into their school and then help us with transportation. A lot of families do decide to do that because sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's closer, um, sometimes, you know, if they want their children to stay all together, if they're kind of in similar um, grades, sometimes that is an option for our families. Um, and then we also have to look at safety. So if, you know, there's some safety planning that needs to happen, or if there's a PFA in place or custody agreement in place, we have to also take that into consideration. Um, and then with enrollment, we also help with any vital documents that they might need. We know a lot of times when someone is fleeing, they're unable to either get all of their documents or some things are kind of lost in trans transport. So we try to get anything that they might need, whether it's birth certificates, social security cards, immunization records. Um, and then if they need, a, need updated assessments, we're able to work with the schools and get that for them as well. 
So we um, have a great partnership with UPMC um, and through the UPMC and their med students, they facilitate a weekly onsite pediatrician clinic, which is um, a really helpful um, you know, tool to have in our program. They come on site, we have families sign up and they're able to see the child for whatever reason. If they're unable to meet the need of the family during that time, they'll set up um, either an appointment, you know, externally, or they'll do some type of screening and assessment and get them connected to some other community resources. We also have a dentist that comes in once a month and will check out the kid's teeth. If there's any procedures or any other thing that a child might need or family might need, they'll help them set up the procedures, they'll help them set up the appointments. Um, and then they'll also kind of call, like they'll come as needed. So if the family can't meet them during that specific time or day, they have worked really hard with our families to making sure they're meeting them exactly where they are. So if they need to come in an extra day or a little bit later than typical, um, they'll try to do that as well. And then in terms of mental health, um, you know, besides Kayla, who we're able to refer our clients to, we also will, um, we have a children's behavioral support advocate position, which really helps with identifying the specific needs of a child. Um, so during the intake, we do ask about, you know, the mental health of a child, you know, any um, challenges or any concerns that a mom might have um, about a child's behaviors. Um, and we try to work with them to see kind of where they're at and what they feel like they need. We also help them with specific parenting issues and getting them connected to resources in the community, um, wh whether it's a parenting support group um, or if it's just resources, um, you know, like literature, books, that sort of thing. We try to get them connected to that as well. And then the behavioral specialist also does, you know, case management with the mothers. They work directly with the CAP advocates and the shelter team to provide advocacy for them as well. So what you're seeing here is um, our one of our check-in boards, we have a couple of check-in boards. It kind of depends on the um, you know, types of kids that we have, but as an agency, we implement the sanctuary model um, by Dr. Sandra Bloom. So one of the things we do with the kiddos to just kind of see where they're at in terms of feelings is you know, we do a daily community meeting with them. You know, hi, how are you feeling today? You know, what are your goals today? who can help you if you need it, that sort of thing. And it kind of gauge, you know, maybe they had a rough day in school, maybe something happened this morning, um, but it really helps them to identify what they're feeling and how we can help and support them in the CAP program. And then with um, the sanctuary model, we also have a self curriculum for children that we utilize in groups. Um, and it, the self stands for safety, emotions, loss, and future. So a lot of the stuff that we do is around safety plans. We do a lot of vision, um, future vision boards. So a lot of collages to help them kind of be creative, but also think about where they could see themselves, you know, as an adult. And then we also do paintings of safe places or places that they would like to go to. Other things that we do are mom and me groups. Um, so we typically split them up into infants and toddlers and school aged children. But these groups are really a place for moms to ask each other questions, ask the facilitators questions. Um, they are able to interact with their children. Maybe that's one thing that they're wanting to work on is building you know, a better and stronger relationship with their children. Um, and some of the activities that they do are anything from cooking to arts and crafts. You know, we do a lot of hand print things in children's, which are always cute and always a hit. Um, we try to do games. We, um, there was one activity that we did that was um, creating rules for your new home. So on this piece of paper that you'll have framed in your house, create new house rules. So once you transition out of shelter, what would you like that to look like? Um, and then we also have summer programming, which is always a huge hit for our kiddos. Um, in the summer, we try to do, um, you know, field trips if possible. We try to have themes each week. Um, last summer, we actually did like a talent show, which was a hit. A lot of, we had a lot of creative kids at that time. So there was some singing, some dancing. Um, we had some drama acts. Um, it was a, it was a whole thing, but we try to, you know, do fun things in the summer because we know out of school time is really important and they have a lot of out of school time in the summer. Some kids may not have access to other summer programming. So we try to make that a fun eight to 10 weeks if, at pos if possible. Um, and we would not be able to function in CAP without our community partners. We rely heavily on a lot of, you know, people, organizations, um, agencies that have done a lot for a program. 
Um, so the picture that you're seeing is actually from um, HCF, so which is the Homeless Children's Education Fund. Each year they help us with book bags, they help us with uniforms, um, they also help us with transportation if needed um, through that enrollment process for school. Um, AIU is a huge one too that also helps with the school enrollment and transportation. They also help us with supplies. Um, we have enrichment programs through both of those um, organizations, which has been really um, cool. And it's been um, one of the main highlights of the program. We also have partnerships with 412 Youth Zone, which helps um, youth 16 to 24 with various things. Typically, they get a youth um, coach and they help them with employment opportunities. Um, if they want to seek college, they you know help them with that process. If they are seeking employment and they need like dress, whether it's um, interview clothing or actual clothing, they help them with that. And then they also help with their mental and physical health. Um, Best of the Batch has been really um, helpful in getting supplies for our program. They also do a book bag drive, but one of the huge highlights that they you know, help with is our um, Christmas time or holiday time. They do individualized gifts for all of our kids, which is always a huge hit. Um, Santa Claus makes an appearance sometime um, and the kids just love it because they're able to just be kids. They're able to enjoy the holidays. Moms don't have to worry about gifts um, and trying to find resources to make the holiday special. Um, and then Art Expressions, as I had mentioned earlier, they do a lot with us. Um, it's a weekly thing and they just came on Monday and they actually painted pumpkins with the kids, which was really fun. Our kids are very competitive right now. So there was a pumpkin painting contest, um, which was really cool, but they do anything from canvas art to um, like window clings to t-shirts, um, anything that we think the kids might like, we try to work with them to, to bring that into the program. And then these, these are some more of our partnerships. Um, the pictures that you are seeing are from Museum on the Move which is through Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Um, and we had a new friend this year, the skunk, um, who came, who did a bunch of different activities with the kids, which was a huge hit. Um, but they also are an enrichment program that we have um, on a weekly basis on Mondays. And they come in and they talk about different, um, whether it's communities, they just did an indigenous um, day with us on Tuesday. Um, and they, you know, talked about Native Americans and what that, you know, looks like. And they answered a bunch of questions from the kids. It's very education based, but also very interactive. Um, and then they also typically bring some type of live animal, insect. Um, they have a snake that they bring a lot. And then this skunk, uh, like I said, was a new addition, but I think they're going to start bringing him um, throughout the year. And then we also have um, the yoga therapy, which is really fun. They teach the kids, um, you know, child-friendly poses. They teach them how to regulate their emotions. They teach them how to calm down, um, how to safely stretch, um, which has been a huge hit. And then we also have um, Beverly's birthdays, which actually put on a monthly birthday party yesterday. Um, they come on a monthly basis um, and they basically celebrate all of the birthdays that month which is really special, especially for children that have never celebrated their birthday. They may have never had a birthday cake before. So yesterday's theme was monsters. So they did um, pin the eye on the monster yesterday, which was a really cool and fun activity. They bring food and cupcakes, and then they also do individualized um, gifts for the kids. For moms that are expecting, they also do little baskets. So they have, you know, onesies and they have, you know, diaper cream, anything that they might need and a little basket for moms that are expecting as well. And then here, this is just a sample calendar. This is actually this week's calendar. So as you can see um, today, we have some community time hours as well as a structured activity, um, which we'll be setting up and preparing for our Halloween Fest, which you can see is on Friday. Um, but this is what a typical week might look like. Each week can differ depending on what's happening, what time of year it is, and then scheduling, um, as well as the size of the families. If we have to kind of you know, limit or you know, make sure our ratios are okay, we'll look and see what works best for the community during that time. And then we'll just kind of you know, flex however we need to. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here, Maggie. Thank you for the introduction for sure. And 
One of the things Maggie said early on in the uh, introduction was one of the programs that I supervised was our school program, which is what I was originally hired in to do at Women's Center and Shelter. So I've seen that program grow over the years. I've met a lot of students over the years and have the honor and pleasure of working with them. So this is um, some of the information that we actually share with the students when we go out to the schools. What is partner balance? So partner balance is a pattern of cohesive behavior used by UPA, let me stop and slow down. That's just what I tell the students when I'm in the school. And then I go back and I have them repeat this word out loud, pattern, because I want it to be very clear that in any relationship, there may be a disagreement. And sometimes teens um, overlook the depth of the behavior because it happened once and something different happened once and something else different happened once. So they don't actually notice it as a pattern unless you teach and talk to them about how to recognize a pattern of coercive behavior that someone uses to gain power and control. And I also have the students say those words out loud. Power and control. If we're in a building or classroom, I have them say it as loud as they can say it without disturbing another uh, classroom down the hall. But I want them to really learn that power and control has many faces, that it's not always just about physical violence. You know, it's uh, that's very important and very dangerous. And we definitely emphasize and talk about physical danger. But we also want them to know how to recognize, again, as I said, the patterns of power and control with an intimate relationship. It can include casual dating, sexual relationships, um, and ongoing uh, relationships as well. Believe it or not, uh, there's students who've had actually in eighth grade who are in four-year relationships. They've been in this relationship since fifth grade, you know, so it's like, a long-term relationship, right? And of course, we have the casual dating. You know, that where it's not recognized, particularly the uh, sexual violence may not be recognized easily on in the uh, dating relationship. But a dating violence is physical, sexual, or verbal abuse of a member of an unmarried couple. And domestic violence is physical, sexual, or verbal abuse of a couple who live together. You know, we see the same symptoms, signs, and behaviors with our eighth, ninth, tenth graders, as we do with our 30, 40, 50 year old uh, clients that want to send the shelter. So let's talk about some of the different types of abuse. There are six that we focus on, although there's obviously multiple other behaviors that uh, attach to these six types of behaviors. So we go through the physical abuse and we recognize that because of movies and TV shows and just life in general, that People understand physical violence, but we do stop and pause even when talking about physical violence to point out restraining. If I had a dollar for every teenager who told me, oh, Miss Rhonda, I would never hit my partner. I, I just restrain. Um, I may just restrain them. So under physical abuse, so it may definitely include restraining, and they don't actually recognize that as a part or form of abuse, right? So you have to really point that out. They get the hitting, the punching, the hair pulling. Um, they may miss some time, the shoving. They don't think of that as necessary. Well, I just push her away is what some guys might say. I'll be very clear that as I go through this presentation in my time with you, that we recognize and we talk in schools that intimate partner violence, teen dating violence happens in all relationships. So it certainly happens in uh, straight relationships, sexual relationships, uh, male to female and female to male. So we definitely have male. Uh, I just had a male student recently at Carlo University come up to me and uh, share his story after my presentation. We also know it is in the TLGBQ plus community as well. So there are schools where that is where there are students who are very comfortable with sharing their identity and talking about abuse within their relationship. And then there are others who, again, like I just mentioned, will come up to me later. But then there's the verbal abuse. And sometimes people like to think that one happens before the other. And that's not necessarily true. Yes, it's rare and unusual that hitting, punching, uh, shoving, kicking will happen when there has not been some other type of abuse. And again, it goes back to knowing how to recognize that pattern. But it's not necessarily so that the, there has been verbal abuse. But verbal abuse definitely includes name calling, degrading, belittling, criticizing putting down your partner uh, as forms of verbal abuse. And the thing that I, as we move on, I like to look at is when we think about emotional abuse and look at the overlap, that when we think about verbal abuse, we may think of it just as in, oh, 
someone was called out of their name, someone was put down. But verbal abuse can go on for, for a period of time. You know, so it is the argument that happened at 6 p.m., the, the uh, 9 p.m. text, the 2 a.m. text, the in school the next day, constant, uh, constant uh, degrading over a period of days. Psychological abuse. So psychological abuse is a form of gaslighting. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Put down, humiliating your partner, demanding all of their attention. So when I often talk about um, psychological abuse, I talk to the students about it's not all, it's not only separating and isolating you from people that you know, but it's also from things. So demanding your attention, you may be very involved in some type of art classes. Uh, TK just talked about kids liking to do artwork, you know, so maybe somebody who is really involved in doing art and their abusive control and partner does not want them to do art, so they destroy all of their supplies and they tear up the uh, completed projects, you know, as a part of wanting them to not uh, do that activity, but to be with them. So those are all forms of psychological abuse. I was amazed this year. We've been in a couple of schools this year already. And I was in an eighth grade classroom and I was talking about these types of abuse. And an uh, eighth grader raised her hand and said, oh, you mean gaslighting? I was like, oh, you know that term. And then she went on to give some examples of what gaslighting is. And then um, we were there for two periods that day. So the next period, you know, I was ready for the students. I know they were going to come in and they knew what gaslighting was. And they actually could talk about examples of gaslighting, getting into somebody's head and making them think crazy. Is how I'm crazy. I'll put air quotes. But it's certainly the term that the students use that they kind of make you think you are wrong or that you did something that you didn't do. And the catch is that the person using power control, they know you didn't do it, you know, and then they do that repeatedly as well as to the point where they make uh, it gets to the point where the uh, victim survivor, the student who's being abused, um, really begins to believe what the person is saying. And, and believes that they uh, may have did or they may actually act the way that this person is saying. So the accusations and accusations often are around you're cheating on me or you're lying, which is right up under there. Uh, threatening suicide, which was another example one of the students actually gave um, when we were doing the presentation. Isolation, I mentioned, keep keeping you away from people, places, and things. We often think of isolation as keeping you away from people. That's very important. I talk to teenagers about recognizing how the gaslighting gets connected to this isolation um, with the verbal abuse because they all overlap, right? So the um, gaslighting around isolation is like, well, you're 15 now, you know, you can make up your own mind. You know, I know you have a mind for yourself, but you just use it sometimes. You don't have to always do what your mom tells you to do, you know, um, or maybe get you young for me in this relationship. Maybe I should find somebody older because. When we think of threats, we think of threats as being like, I'm starting to hit you, hurt you, or harm you. But the psychological threats are also things like that. Maybe we just need to break up. You're not old enough or mature enough for me in this relationship. There is also, as I mentioned, there is also abuse in marginalized communities as well. And it can be more difficult for people in marginalized communities to actually get help. Some of the threats in a TLGBQ plus a couple may be threatening to tell someone, you know, and that's important at any phase in life. But picture it at 13 when you're still figuring it out for yourself. You're figuring out life for yourself. You're figuring out um, your own identity. You're figuring out just questioning yourself and answering for yourself as well. And you get in a relationship with somebody maybe a year older, two years older, but you trust this person. And when you are ready to move on, they threaten to tell your mom, your parents, the school. They threaten to use uh, other types of forms of abuse to actually keep you in that relationship by threatening to tell people your gender identity or how um, what has gone on actually in your relationship. You know, refusing to use correct pronouns is another form of uh, abuse within uh, the TLGBQ plus community as well and denying somebody's identity. The manipulation around um, citizenship is another form of abuse. You asked, also heard Maggie when she did the introduction say that we have a real program. 
which is RIL, Refugee Immigrant and Limited English Speakers. And we also have students in the immigration population in the schools that we go to as well. So we want to be inclusive in our presentations when we are given all this information. We talk about how it happens in all communities, all ethnicities, all socioeconomic groups. Um, so we want to be inclusive in that as well. And then working with um, students who may have disabilities and being inclusive there. And we had a student actually at Carlo who shared her testimony and her journey when we did a presentation. She actually co-presented with me at the college level and talked about her former boyfriend who took away her assistive de device, you know, and hiding things from her, breaking things that she needed for her survival and her day-to-day -day living. You know, so before she, she's out of that relationship, I think she said eight years out now, and she feels much safer. But just knowing that that happens in um, all marginalized demographics as well. So sexual abuse. I'm going to go to the graphic on the right first. No means no. Yeah, we've heard that for years. But no means no um, is broader than just the word no. It's I'm not sure, or um, maybe later not right now, or I know I said yes earlier, but now I changed my mind. Uh, please don't do that. I don't like that, you know. Uh, I'm not comfortable doing this, um, and I don't feel like it right now. So what we're teaching students now is only an enthusiastic yes is a yes, because if you talk someone you, into having sexual relations with you, if you talk someone to make them touch you or feel you on parts of your body, and you just keep going over and over, come on, it won't hurt, it won't take a long time. And we know the stories that have been told just to try to talk someone into doing something that they really don't do. That is still a form of rape. And I have to mention that um, one of the programs I also do, and I think this is on one of my end slides, but I'll say now, is I also do a program with Allegheny County CIS program, which is a community and census supervised program. There's a program for young men who've been adjudicated delinquent, and they come to a center in various neighborhoods. And I can tell you, when I get to this part of the lesson, I have realized it's going to take up the remainder of that lesson. So we're talking about types of abuse, when we get to sexual abuse, there's a lot of well, what if. And uh, so when we say things like it's rape if um, the person is under the influence of substance abuse, uh, questions like, well, what if we're both under the influence? And everybody, or not everybody, I'm sorry, but a lot of teens want to uh, minimize rape and say, well, what if this happened? Or what if they said yes? And then they change it. And I have to constantly really um, em emphasize that legally it is rape at any point that a person says, stop, no, don't do that. Um, so again, it's uh, one it's touching, it's cheating. And I get a lot of questions about how is cheating a part of sexual abuse? If we're believed to be in a monogamous relationship, particularly one where we are experiencing or having sexual relationships and maybe unprotected sex, and I believe that we are one-on-one, -on -one, you're not cheating. And now you can, um, when you cheat, you're putting me at risk, health risk for one, for one, and other types of risk. Remember, all the types of abuses do overlap. So then that begins to go into the emotional, the psychological abuse as well. Um, criticizing the person sexually, talking about a former partner who was better, or a former partner who let them do things that you won't let me do, tying it back into the gaslighting. Maybe you're not ready for this kind of relationship. Just overall types of insults and types of degrading that is related to sex, uh, also around body parts, so degrading them about their uh, certain body parts as well. Digital abuse is something, when I get to this part, I say to the students, this is something you all know more about than I do. Again, you see the graphic on the right, that's a text message. Where are you? Heart, 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 I love you. Where are you? Where are you? Who are you with? And then you see the emojis at the bottom. So digital abuse, stalking the person, following them around, you know, leaving like nice little gifts in their locker or other places like that that they can find. Follow up unexpectedly, she says, or he says, the person in the relationship says that they're going to the mall with their friends or with their family member and their partner shows up at the mall uh, just, just because they just happen to be there, right? You know, so doing things to actually scare the victim survivor by letting them know that they were there. You know, that's like leaving notes. I had a student tell me one time 
that um, their abusive partner texted them and said, I see what you have on. You know, I don't like that outfit. This person didn't go to the same school with them, you know. So again, getting inside their head and leaving all kinds of messages. And it's not always abusive. It goes in a cycle. So when you think about the pattern of behavior, um, it doesn't go away. It's always present, but it's not always at the same part. So when you look at the honeymoon phase, yeah, after an abusive relation, abusive incident is, I'm sorry. You know what? I have the students finish these five sentences for me. And this is true whether I am with eighth graders, 10th graders, and adults. And I'll say, after an abusive relationship, finish the sentence for me, please. I am so sorry. You know, I didn't mean it. It will never happen again. You know how much I love you. Please don't leave me. This is from eighth grade, all of us who are adults that we can um, say that and fill in those blanks, right? So, um, but we know that in the cycle of violence that is going to repeat itself. It doesn't just go away. I think we're getting really close to our Q and A. We've heard a lot of stats, so we're going to skip this slide. Um, just paying attention that teen dating violence is important, and it can be difficult because teenagers are not often listened to. Um, so, at Women's Center and Shelter, we've had a relationship with Pittsburgh Public Schools uh, for more than 30 years. I've been here 32 years. We provide educational lectures, presentations, um, and we also go to colleges and universities. We also have um, lectures and presentations to community programs um, and on the dynamics of abusive relationships, our services, and teaching how to get help and how to help a friend is very important work that we also do it at that age level. Uh, how can I get support? Uh, teen survivors can often uh, can obtain a PFA order, which can significantly limit the interaction. Uh, that the survivor has with the perpetrator. We teach schools how to separate them from classrooms and lunches and buses together. Uh, safety planning with a trusted adult is very important. Also, telling someone about abuse is integral to a survivor's safety. So we do encourage them to find a trusted adult. It may be a teacher, it may be a coach, it may be a godparent, but finding someone who they can share that information with as well as going online looking at local and national hotlines and other organizations. So I think that takes us right to our Q&A. All right. Thank you so much, Rhonda, Kayla, and TK. That was just fantastic. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Nicole Molinaro. I'm the president and CEO for Women's Center and Shelter and very happy to be able to uh, guide the question and answer session. So we have several really fantastic questions in the chat. Um, and I'll ask the first one. And as I ask the first one, please feel free to put more questions in the chat um, or uh, just come off of mute, like raise your hand and, and we, can, we can call on you if you want to answer the question. So the first question we're going to ask um, is from Jeremy, which is if you can please talk about any of the unique challenges that you saw with children during COVID, um, either to do with virtual school or to do with um, having to, uh, you know, for non-resident kids, it was really being home, um, potentially doing school and also dealing with the, the violence that they were witnessing at home. But any unique or special challenges that you saw during COVID? And really, that can be for Rhonda, Kayla, or TK, anybody who wants to answer that. Rhonda. I was going to say, TK, did you want to respond to it in um, <laughs> regarding in your program in CAP? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think we saw was technology. So we worked a lot with the Pittsburgh Public Schools to make sure our kiddos had laptops or iPads, any um, other devices that they might need, as well as the actual program itself on technology. So, you know, we, whenever we couldn't, you know, get a hold of the school or if we couldn't do it in a timely manner, we would try to um, loan out some of our laptops that we had and our iPads to make sure that they were able to kind of keep on track with their schooling. Um, and then transportation was a huge, um, I think, challenge as well. There were a lot of school systems that were struggling with, you know, finding bus drivers or drivers. So we really had to problem solve around that and find solutions for each family um, you know, given them their circumstances. Yeah. Thanks, TK. Um, Rhonda, did you want to, did you want to add anything to that? One of the things, thank you. Yes, Nicole. One of the things that I'm going to add is that during the pandemic, 
um, students didn't have the opportunity to go to people for help and support that they usually could go to. So that was one of the things. The other thing that I've heard is the time because of the pandemic that they were expected to just be with their um, boyfriend, girlfriend, or their partner more because they did not have to go to uh, physical buildings for schools and they could uh, get together in the same place, space to actually do their work. So that was one of the other things that I heard, I've heard since we've been back in person. Right. And I'll just add to that, as we know, and as we saw, unfortunately, every single day, domestic violence really increased in frequency, severity, and complexity over the pandemic. So I think we all saw that in our clients of, of all ages and definitely including children. Um, all right. So if we go on, thanks. That was Jeremy's question. Thanks so much for a great question, Jeremy. Um, Kelly has a question. Do you uh, do we help parents learn how to support their children? The big emotions or behaviors that can uh, come with witnessing domestic violence. So uh, TK or Kayla, you want to handle that? I can speak to that um, from the counseling side. I definitely work with parents who you know bring their children to counseling and. Um, like I spoke about earlier, a lot of times uh, parents can present with like this awful behavior and they're being bad and things like that. And that's totally valid. And that's definitely a hard experience for parents. And so taking the time to explain to the parent, you know, why that behavior might be happening and how they can support their child, whether that's being the adult that mirrors good behaviors, being the adult that mirrors good responses to big emotions, things like that. We want to make sure we're giving the whole family, all the tools they need for each piece of the family to be successful and have like that holistic care. Great, awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, okay, and we have very little time. So we're gonna um, go to Sandy's question in the chat. And Rhonda, I'm thinking this one uh, can be for you. Is there any evidence that obtaining a PFA can escalate the violence? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for asking that. And we learn that more from the clients that we work with as well as the young people that we work with. So we actually always leave it up to the victim survivor to determine if they think it will be uh, safe for them to get a PFA. We talk about pros, we talk about cons, we talk about safety. We do a lot of safety planning with clients and with students as well. So it's really up to a client to lead us as a saying that we have who's driving the bus and we say the client is always driving the bus. So as far as evidence that it can escalate, actually, yes, sir, it can escalate because of the PFA. And the sad truth, this is what I always say about intimate partner violence, the sad truth is it can also escalate without a PFA. When it comes to hearing about PFAs in the news, we always hear about the few that don't work. So often when there's a homicide, they'll say, and they had a PFA, it always makes it sound as negative. And I don't know the number by heart, but it was like thousands of PFA just in Allegheny County. 4,000. 4,000? A year. Yeah, about that. Yeah. About 4,000 a year. And we may hear about the three that didn't work. And that's heartbreaking, particularly if there's been a homicide. That's heartbreaking. But please remember, there are thousands that have been helpful. Mm -hmm. So we do help our clients and students and youth understand that. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, so we have a couple more questions. What I'm going to recommend, though, because it's 1258, we want to be aware of every and respectful of everybody's time. I'm going to ask if Maggie can go kind of close us up with the last few slides. And then if the panelists don't mind hanging out, Jeremy had one more question. Um, and then if anybody has any questions, um, you can just hang out and ask at that point if that's OK. So. I will now turn it back over to Maggie. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you uh, all the participants for joining us today. And thank you so much again to our sponsor, Aspirant. Um, if you or a loved one is feeling unsafe, please know that Women's Center and Shelter is here for you 24-7. You can call our hotline or text us or chat with us through our website, wcscanhelp.org, to be connected with, to a domestic violence advocate. And you can find more Domestic Violence Awareness Month programming at dvampgh.org, including our new advocacy calendar, which gives you actions you can take each day in the month of October to become more informed about domestic violence and support survivors on their journeys to safety. Thank you again all for coming. We really, really appreciate it. This is an excellent panel. And if you have um, a couple extra minutes, it would be great. And you have questions, please feel free to stick around and hear um, our panelists answer some more questions. Thank you all.
Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so we'll like take a one second break here and then we'll go back to the questions. Um, so Jeremy had a quite another question, which is a great one. Uh, Jeremy says, I realize it's not as common, but if a father is a domestic violence victim and utilizing women's center services, are their children eligible to participate in the children's advocacy program? Or is it only for moms? So TK, do you wanna handle that one? Yeah, sure. So it's the program is for anyone that is util utilizing the services at women's center. Um, male, female, non-binary. We've had some grandparents who have legal custody of their grandchildren. So it's really whoever is utilizing um, any you know, other services, we try to work with them and meet them wherever they are. Awesome. Thanks, TK. Uh, and any, what other questions? Anybody have any other questions that you didn't get to ask? If you can raise your hand so that we can um, see you and get to your question or put it in the chat. All right, in hindsight, we probably could have just gotten to that question during the presentation, <laughs> but, but that is okay. And um, we're recorded, so if people wanted to, they can come back and ask. Exactly. Oh, good. Tiffany has a question. Oh, wait, it just bounced out. Hang on a second. Tiffany, how can I get my kid into therapy, kids into therapy without needing to stay at the shelter? Oh, Tiffany, great question, because you absolutely don't need to be in the shelter to get help. Um, T, uh, Kayla, please take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in having um, therapy for your kids, you can call our hotline um, and the hotline advocate will then help you to have that referral created, sent to me, and then um, I'll be contacting you to help kind of move that process forward. But if you just contact our hotline, uh, those advocates will help you get that process started. Yeah. Thanks, Kayla. And I'll just add to that. We about of our 7,500 plus clients that we serve a year, only about 4%, including adults and children, actually need the services of our shelter. <clears throat> Excuse me, the other 96% um, use all of our non-resident services. So there's a lot of services available at Women's Center and Shelter. Um, most people don't need shelter. If you need shelter, that means you're in a potentially lethal situation and we definitely wanna be able to help you with not just shelter, but all of our other services. But you know, um, there's many people not in that position uh, but who are in need of other supportive services. And we um, want to absolutely be able to help anybody in with any of their needs. So any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. That was a great one there, Tiffany. And just, um, I put it in the chat, but if you are interested in obtaining counseling for your child um, and per Kayla's instructions, our 24-7 hotline phone number is 412-687-8005. Or you can text us uh, Monday through Friday, 9, oh, sorry, five, 9 to 5, I apologize, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, at 412-744-8445. Awesome. And Sandy had a great question. Um, when will this recording be available? Sandy, that's one question I actually don't know the, the answer to, but Kristen or Jake, um, can you pop in with this one? Or it should be just a, uh, in a couple of days. Yeah, Jake put it in the chat. Just a couple of days. We should have it available. Awesome. And where will they be uh, made available? Just sent out by email or are they uploaded somewhere? Yeah, it's both. So we'll send an email to everyone who registered and the link will be in there. And then it will also be on the um, dvampittsburgh.org website as well. Awesome. All right. Many thanks to um, Jake and Kristen and our development department, to Maggie for moderating, to Kayla, CK, and Rhonda for presenting, and to Aspirant, our amazing friend and sponsor and partner. And thanks so everybody. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks.